I'm Duncan McLeod, and this is the Tech Central Show. TCS is brought to you by MTN Business. Visit mtnbusiness.co.za to learn more, and we thank them for partnering with the show for, and for helping bring you these great interviews. Now, my guest today is Bruce Malado. Bruce is Professor of Physics at the University of Advertisrant. He is a particle physicist, and he's been involved, spearheading even, a project to build a cost-effective air quality monitoring system based on sensors, Internet of Things technology, and artificial intelligence. It's called, I think it's pronounced AIR, is that, is that right? A-I underscore R. Correct. Uh, pronounced AIR. Um, and Bruce recently published a very interesting piece on the conversation, which we republished here on Tech Central, and we'll include a link to that in the show notes, in which he wrote about the device and the project. Bruce, uh, thanks for making the time, and uh, welcome to Tech Central. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Before we talk about the project and the device you guys have built, um, I, I do think uh, that you are the first particle physicist we've ever interviewed on the Tech Central show. Um, what are some of the exciting things that you're working on at the moment? That's a very good question. So um, if you remember, the Higgs boson was discovered um, in July 2012. Yes. And the interest of particle physics has shifted after the discovery towards discovering new particles. So we just uh, got a, an article published in the Nature Portfolio, Nature Reviews Physics, where we review what we think are anomalies in the data that may point mm -hmm. to new bosons. So that's what we've been working for almost 10 years, mm -hmm. uh, lead, led by our team. And uh, we have very strong signals of what we think may be new bosons in the data. And uh, as such, we are publishing, we're publishing uh, quite often about these excesses. Uh, we're preparing a new uh, article for nature and so on and so forth. So we're very excited about it. What's the significance of it, of this potential discovery? That's a very good question. So uh, the Higgs boson uh, was postulated and it was um, put forward by theorists yes. in the 60s. Then what we know now as the standard model of particle physics was established in the 70s, and the Higgs boson is a part of that standard model. Mm -hmm. um, it took a long time to discover because it's an elusive particle that's difficult to detect. Um, and as I said, it was discovered in 2012. So essentially what happens here is that uh, for a number of reasons, and namely because it was difficult to detect, it was the last main prediction of the standard model, the last particle that hadn't been observed uh, that was observed in 2012. And that basically closes the standard model. But we know there's a lot of the stuff out there that in nature that the standard model doesn't describe. Mm -hmm. And uh, now that we have the Higgs boson, which is responsible for the generation of masses of known particles, we think that there will be other similar bosons that will help us understand um, most of the matter in the universe that we don't know anything about. Okay. Because we know there's a lot of matter in the universe that we can't touch or doesn't interact with particles um, of known matter, so to say. We know there's matter in the world that, and in nature that we simply don't know anything about. So is the uh, particle accelerator in Europe looking for these? Correct. So the Lacheron Collider uh, continues to take data, mm -hmm. so a lot of data that continues to be delivered to the experiments. Um, and um, with that new data that came years after the Higgs boson was discovered, we believe there's signs of new bosons in the data. So that new boson could be the key to that new matter. Mm -hmm. That's what we're so, so excited about, and the significance would be as large as the Higgs boson. Itself. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. I'm, I must keep an eye out on that story. Absolutely. Uh, I will do so. Um, but let's talk about the, uh, the air device and the project. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, how did a particle physicist get involved in a project like this? That's a very good question, and the connection is almost direct. Because what particle physicists do, as you already uh, alluded earlier, we have an accelerator, mm -hmm. that's the Large Hadron Collider, uh, the Large Hadron Collider provides protons that are going to collide head-on, but you need a detector mm -hmm. to record those collisions. You can think of a detector as a very complicated camera that takes data 40 million times a second. So it's as if you are taking pictures 40, times a se 40 million times a second. 
So that basically generates this whole methodology of taking data, shipping data, and analyzing data, which is our bread and butter. Mm -hmm. Our air is, as you already alluded to, is a sensor made of communication, internal things, that is fed into artificial intelligence, which is data analysis. So it basically comprises the same steps uh, that we have to go through in particle physics to detect particles. Interesting. And as such, AR Air, AI underscore R, is really a byproduct. We call a technology transfer activity mm -hmm. of the uh, South African participation at CERN. And okay. it's a direct byproduct of it. In fact, it's developed in collaboration with the European Lab CERN. So nothing like this has been developed before? Well, it, I believe that we are the first team in the world that has been able to integrate the three technologies, sensors, internal things, and artificial intelligence in a cost-effective way. That's for sure. Okay. Now, I'm not aware of other efforts globally that could entail much more expensive ways of doing it. I'm sure it's been tried, mm -hmm. but in a cost-effective way, um, certainly is the first time that we are aware of. How has, uh, how has air pollution in South Africa been measured up to now? Presumably much bigger measuring stations, much costlier. Correct. Um, so the, 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 the conundrum of, of air quality monitoring revolves around cost of devices. Okay? So there's two big issues. First, the cost of devices, and second, in order to really understand the real impact of air quality, you have to develop dense networks mm -hmm. of measurements. It doesn't cut it to put one or two devices oh. somewhere in the city mm -hmm. because air quality is driven by hot spots, and that's a fundamental issue. You know, in order for us to really truly understand the impact on health, the impact on labor and labor efficiency, you really need to understand where and when those hotspots are located. So you need to at least place sensors every 500 meters in a city mm -hmm. to really understand how poor or how well, uh, or how good the air quality is, okay? So South Africa today has, I mean, the South African government, you know, makes a big effort in measuring air quality. Uh, they have developed the SACIS, the South African Air Quality Information System, mm -hmm. which comprises about 130 stations, but these are very expensive. Mm -hmm. So everybody agrees, experts, government, agrees that the way to go is to use these existing expensive stations as calibrating and central nodes of networks or m of more cost-effective sensors that would surround them. Mm -hmm. basically. You can think of um, the, the existing network and the existing infrastructure as the core of a much bigger uh, network of sensors right. made of more cost-effective technology. In telecommunications, they talk about mesh networks where you've got devices that connect to each other rather than to a central server and then the information is shared in that way and it becomes like a mesh infrastructure. Is, this, is it a similar concept with the air devices? IoT in principle is flexible enough to accommodate se several approaches and mm -hmm. technologies, right? So the mesh network is one option. Now, the drawback of the mesh network is that all the sensors are participating in transmitting signals of all the nodes. So that will basically take more, um, more energy, more power, and some of these devices will have to be running on batteries. Mm -hmm. um, so you can connect to the cellular network, for instance. Cellular network is ubiquitous in cities, even in the African continent, it's mm -hmm. everywhere. And in principle, one node would talk to the cellular network um, or radio frequency uh, type of communications, all right? Uh, that being said, there are advantages to mesh networks that we also um, uh, take advantage of. We're, we are not writing it off at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting, okay. So um, the trouble with these sensors in the past is that they've been too expensive. Um, yes. You've developed this uh, um, solution. Uh, who, who's developed it for you? Was it um, was the IP developed here in South Africa? The integration is is totally local, mm -hmm. and the assembly and bringing together of other components, including artificial intelligence, is local. Now, when it comes to sensors, we uh, have a partnership with a Swiss company, mm -hmm. Sensirian, 
that has become a leader globally in the manufacturing of laser-based particulate matter um, measuring measurements with cost-effective technologies. They are very well established globally, and they've basically demonstrated that their technology is uh, both cost-effective and is accurate enough to establish poor air quality. Okay. That's very well known. And we've tested also in the South African conditions. We've tested and measured and benchmarked these devices against uh, high-quality measurements mm. from the Saki system. So that's, that's the, the, the core technology for um, measuring air quality, mm -hmm. which we, did, we didn't need you know, to reinvent the wheel here. Mm -hmm. It wasn't certainly necessary there. Then we have Internet of Things uh, protocols, which already exists, uh, whether it is Wi-Fi or um, LTE or LoRa communications, we use all of them. Mm -hmm. And then everything has to be wrapped up through a, a cloud-based um, gathering of data with artificial intelligence um, algorithms, which we have developed in-house. Okay. What does the AI do exactly? AI do can, can do many things. Depends on the question mm -hmm. you're posing. Um, but one of the things that... Um, oh, so it's a generative AI solution that, that collects the data from these devices that you can then interrogate with prompts. Is that how it works? That's one of the applications. Okay. I mean, generative AI is one of the brands of AI or types of AI within the machine learning ecosystem that we have. Now, one of the most important applications is the ability to predict. Mm -hmm. Okay? How is the air quality going to be tomorrow in a particular spot? So these are complex geotemporal systems that need predictions, both in space and time. And there are particular types of algorithms that we have mastered and developed our own uh, combination of mathematics and algorithms that allow us to predict uh, what's going to happen mm -hmm. where. Okay. Okay. So the ability to predict is very, very important as well. So one of the goals that this exercise has is that we will have a government-sponsored app that everybody will download, and then you will be able to know what is the air quality where you are and where you're going to be 24 hours from now. Mm -hmm. So if it gets too bad, and if the level of uh, particulate matter is too high, just wear a mask. And something as simple as that could save tremendous amount of, of, uh, of cost mm. to the healthcare system and, um, and labor place mm -hmm. in general because okay. of, the, of the fact that, you know, when we breathe poor air quality, we become tired, we have headaches, and that has direct impact on our efficiency uh, in the, um, uh, our work. I, I imagine the weather forecast must play a big role in... Uh... The weather forecast is one of the inputs mm -hmm. that the model uses. Of course, the probability of rain is very important, uh, the direction of wind and all that, and we get that information from the South African weather system mm -hmm. in addition to other measurements that we mm -hmm. make. Mm -hmm. And also satellite data play an important role. So that's also integrated into a data set in real okay. time. Okay. I've noticed uh, just driving around uh, Gauteng actually uh, recently that um, uh, particularly early in the morning you drive past townships in particular on cold winter mornings and there's just this layer of smog over the houses. Um, I, I imagine f the burning of wood to, to keep people warm, coal as well, uh, must be the, some of the biggest pollutants in, certainly in, in, in the Gauteng region. Yeah, mo most certainly burning is a huge uh, concern of mm -hmm. us. And we have to understand, I mean, we have to be realistic. Sometimes we have to burn, but do we have to burn all the time? Mm. Is there legal burning? Uh, we have to really um, hone in on, on that question because yeah. you're right. Uh, combustion creates massive amounts of pollutants. Mm. Many of them are highly toxic. Uh, depends on what you burn. I mean, Especially plastic. For instance, mm -hmm. but there are other substances that can be burned leading to very, very toxic and nasty uh, chemicals mm -hmm. and compounds um, that are very damaging to uh, human health. But also traffic in general is also very, uh, produces quite, quite an amount of, um, of uh, particulate matter. For instance, in the city of Johannesburg, you can clearly see the difference between day and night. Mm -hmm. And the peaks typically, uh, at least in the areas we have measured, come right after the rush hour, especially in the evening. You okay. actually reach 
the biggest peaks mm. of, uh, of poor air quality around that time. Yeah. So we need to manage that as well. Um, and th the population needs to know where, when and where their quality is poor mm -hmm. that can affect their, their lifestyle and yeah. their, their health. So is the idea with these devices that uh, they are rolled out by the government or is the idea that, that me as an ordinary consumer could buy one and put it in my house and become part of that network? I would say both. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, because the implementation of artificial intelligence in uh, mesh networks or networks of air quality is relatively new. Mm -hmm. It's been researched and the proof of principle is there in the literature. We have also published papers. Um, but now the issue is about implementation with large number of sensors. So we are going to a different level of proof of principle, which is no longer research. Mm -hmm. It's more uh, R&D pertaining to the ability to sustain, maintain, and model in real time large number of sensors. So we've got funding from different sources, from the South African government, uh, from the Canadian IDRC and other sources, um, uh, the Clean Air Fund, the UK-based uh, Clean Air Fund, to uh, roll out hundreds of those devices. So that will be the largest network rolled out in Africa, mm -hmm. which, in addition, will be run and interpreted through artificial intelligence. So before government embarks, government, we work with government, we are technically part of SACIS, um, and we render data to SACIS as well. Um, but government needs to see and other stakeholders needs to see how these large networks work. So that proof of principle needs to be delivered. Mm -hmm. Because one thing is to say the devices or the individual device works well, but how do the networks work and deliver? How are they able to capture the real picture on the ground? That's a more complex question mm -hmm. that requires rollout. I mean, the good news is that we now have procured funding to do so. And towards the end of the year, we will roll out at least 130 more census. Hopefully, there will be hundreds more coming in 25. Mm -hmm. Can I buy one? Can I? Can sure, I? yeah. How, do, how does one do that? Well, you would have con contact our, our technical team and place an order mm -hmm. on the website because what we do is we're basically going to launch production campaigns using South African industry. Uh, we have uh, partnerships in South Africa for the production of PCBs and the population of the of the PCBs, and we take orders and we add it. You know, we don't uh, make a profit out of it. We are happy to see people willing to deploy devices um, elsewhere. We are really, I mean, it's very important that people realize mm. that this is a um, a collective responsibility. We really need to know where the air is bad. Mm -hmm. We cannot overstate or understate the problem, but the only way to do it is to really measure in a granular way. Yes. So uh, we're very happy to, I mean, after the publication of and, and our TV interviews and all that, we've gotten a tremendous amount of requests, mm -hmm. which we are trying to cope with. Okay. Uh, but the idea is that we are going to be launching uh, the first production around October. Mm -hmm. So we are going to be accommodating those requests. Okay. okay. And ship it to people for people to, um, uh, to deploy. And what's, what's the, what is the website address for people who want to learn more about it? Is, uh, if you Google SACA QM, S A C A Q M. Mm -hmm. You will you will find it right find away. Sakaqm.org, I believe. Okay. And if you own one of these devices, uh, can you get access to the data that's on it yourself through some sort of app, or is there a screen on the device? It, it's available through a web interface. So mm -hmm. in principle, all the data is available. Uh, all the data of all the sensors that have been deployed so far. We have deployed about twenty in schools in Soweto and. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Wits University, Itemba Labs, and um, um, the Netcare Hospital, Mill Park Hospital. Oh, interesting. Um, and all that data can be downloaded. All, all of it? it? Yes. Okay. All of it. Yes. Okay. And I presume that you can actually take that data and then do some interesting graphical it's, charting it's with it. It's up to you. I mean, we yeah. provide um, uh, basic analytic tools yeah. for people to look into that data and do comparisons and do basic analytics. We will also make the artificial intelligence, at least the output of it, public as well. When mm -hmm. we have sufficient data to model on, that will also be a part of, uh, of the graphical interface. Is there a retail price on this yet, by the way? So we are aiming at um, a production cost of about $100, mm -hmm. taking into account the components that we need to uh, bring about the um, uh, quotes from local industry. So it should be around that. Of course... 
that is when we go into large, massive productions of mm -hmm. tens of thousands. So when we produce hundreds, it will be somewhat more expensive. Okay, okay. And uh, who, who has been involved in this project? Um, obviously, WITS, but uh, who, who else has been providing but input and development? It's an international concert. It's, first of all, it's important to uh, recognize that these things have to be done by interdisciplinary teams. So we have not just physicists, but we have engineers, electrical engineers, data scientists, public health specialists, doctors. So we have, uh, in South Africa, we have uh, uh, colleagues from uh, the UCT, from the Uni University of Pretoria, of course, Wits University, Timber Labs. Um, we have colleagues in Europe. We have coll colleagues in the States, um, in Canada. So it's fairly, uh, I would say, it, if we try to acquire a 360 degree view of the problem. Now we recognize that the problem of air quality monitoring is mostly of systems engineering, but you cannot just design a system being just a pure technologist without talking to public health specialists mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. environmental experts mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. So we, um, we have as such a fairly diverse team of folks, including community engagements. Uh, last but not least, because you need to talk to the community. We have experts in community engagements because this is a very serious problem um, at the community level. Mm -hmm. And from the devices that you've deployed in the field so far, have you come across some findings that you perhaps weren't expecting? Well, first of all, we didn't really know what we were expecting because mm -hmm. we haven't really measured in this area with such a level of granularity. What we have learned is that whenever somebody burns something, the uh, spikes are tremendous. It really goes mm. beyond hazardous very quickly. And these devices are able to pick it up very, very quickly, which led us to think, well, this could also be used to alert government and other stakeholders that something is being burned. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, that obviously we are learning as, you know, you're always learning as a scientist, you know, every day. And, but I was actually quite surprised by how strong those spikes are when something is burned or something burns in the neighborhood. It's really massive. So that really, you know, begs the question, you know, uh, how, how unhealthy is to bry? To bry. <laughs> you know, it's, it's actually a, a mundane question. But Don't tell South Africans say, this. <laughs> I know. I, I, I would be lynched. But there's a reality when you... Yeah. When combustion happens mm. close by, mm -hmm. the diffusion of particles basically permeates almost everything around yes. the source, and then you basically get exposed to very high concentrations. And when I say high, mm -hmm. I'm talking about you know way, way above the level of hazardous concentrations. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not talking about just about. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's something that 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 uh, surprised us a little bit. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, we often think of pollution, we think of chimney stacks and big industry and ESCOM coal-fired power plants out, in, uh, out on the Pumalanga High Felt. Um, but um, a lot of the pollution we actually see in Johannesburg, and I think this is the pollution that's actually getting worse, is local. Um, yes. Um, you know, vagrants burning the plastic off copper cables down by the local river or right. a braai or... Um, whatever it happens to be, as someone burning something they shouldn't be burning in their backyard. Right. Do, you, do you think that's actually the bigger problem than industrial pollution? Well, we are trying to get a comprehensive picture as we roll out, and we will also roll out in the high field. Okay, and, and you know we're not downplaying any source. We are now, as we are deploying large number of sensors, we're going to get the opportunity to probe the different sources and the role that each source plays in generating large concentrations of particular matter. So at this point in time, we don't want to rush into conclusions. We, we want to be um, evidence-based before we conclude anything. And at this point in time, so far based on what we have learned, mm. burning creates very big spikes and in Johannesburg traffic plays a big role. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that what we know now based on the limited number of um, devices that we have rolled out. Now. Have we acquired a comprehensive picture? Not yet. We are basically getting there. Within the next 12 months or so, we will have hundreds of systems deployed, including in the high field and similar areas where we're going to start probing uh, the different sources. And in mm -hmm. fact, one of the key questions that one has to address when you deal with the complexity of air quality is the sources. Where are the sources? 
where are they located? How does diffusion work? Where is the cloud moving from and to? Mm -hmm. And unless you measure and have this AI that will allow you to create this complex geotemporal picture, mm -hmm. you, you can only guess. A big problem on, on certainly on the eastern side of South Africa during winter is felt fires. Yes. Uh, I imagine that's also has a huge impact on on yes. these readings and on the pollution that people are breathing in. And we have to measure everything to really truly understand because the problem with air quality is that on the one hand, you know, environmental analysis, chemical analysis, the the science of air quality is very well understood. It's yep. very advanced. There is massive amount of articles, there's a massive body of literature mm -hmm. on the subject. Scientists understand air quality very well, but on the other hand, it's not monitored. So how can you connect that knowledge with remedial action? It's only through actual measurement that you mm -hmm. can say, this is bad, but how bad is it is the key question you have to address. Mm -hmm. And how, the, how do the clouds move and where do they go? And how, how long does a fire last in terms of its damaging action on people and animals and whatnot. Mm -hmm. All those things need to be measured in order for us to really prioritize what are the most important remedial action and steps that need to be taken to alleviate the problem. And it's a very complex problem. Um, we know it's bad, yes, no questions asked, but we don't really know in the South African context uh, how bad it is or how good it is. Sometimes mm -hmm. you can have, surprisingly enough, cold spots nearby a, uh, a, a, a source of pollution, mm -hmm. okay? But you need to know where the cloud is going to really identify the spots and the areas that will be severely affected. Mm -hmm. Unless you measure, it's very difficult to model from first principles. Very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, imagine that eventually um, South African or Johannesburg residents or any resident of any city in this country, for example, would be able to access a visual resource online where they can actually see a map of where the pollution hotspots are across the city? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's within our reach within the next three years. Okay. I'm sure we will have that, at least in Johannesburg. Mm -hmm. We're working very hard with City of Johannesburg, uh, Department of Health, Department of, Department of Education, Department of Science and Innovation, the, D, uh, the DFFA as well, to make that happen, to create a large pilot for that to take mm -hmm. place. And in fact, that's exactly what we need. We need a heat map yes. of air quality, but not only what's going on today, what's going to happen tomorrow, so that you're prepared. So you can do the uh, forecast. So you can do forecast together mm -hmm. with the weather forecast. Right. Okay, so even on the evening news, when they've got the charts up, you could say, oh, here's, here's what the pollution Ideally, situation is yes. going to be like in Johannesburg tomorrow. E exactly. Ideally, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. Although uh, you will certainly need something like a map, yeah. that you will need to zoom in into. So it's going to be difficult to say the quality of air in Johannesburg will be such and such. Right, it's because it's very localized. Because it's very, very localized. But at least users will have, users that have access to the internet mm -hmm. and have access to the app will certainly be able to uh, have an educated um, guess yeah. of how bad it's going to be, where they're going to go tomorrow. There's some very good websites out there, actually. Um, I, I think uh, one is is called Earth. One is called Venture Sky. I don't know if you've come across these websites. Yeah. Um, they they provide on a global scale details about particular matter in the atmosphere, and you can often correlate it to large fires. For example, when those yeah. huge fires were happening in Canada earlier this year, Correct. you go onto the, one of those websites, you could see the scale of the particulate matter in the atmosphere. Um, I'm guessing that the quality of that data, though, when you zoom right into city level and down to suburb level is probably not that accurate. Okay, so let me backtrack a little bit. In principle, you can get macro events such as you know, big burning or fires, even through satellite data. Yes. Okay. It's no question about that. So, but the thing is that we are, I mean, that's a catastrophic event. Yeah. That doesn't yeah. happen every day. What you really want to monitor is all these micro sources mm -hmm. of, um, of poor air quality mm -hmm. and pollutants that are put in the air on a regular basis and how those create spikes together with burning of materials here and there. Yeah. So that's what really we are exposed for the most part to is all this aggregated uh, ensemble of uh, mm. small sources. Mm -hmm. Okay. And for that, you need um, measurements on the on ground. The ground. Yeah. Uh, certainly satellite data is not there yet mm. 
to provide that kind of information. And the idea, I presume, is well down the line, and, and a lot of this eventually is going to come down to enforcement and whether the data you're collecting is actually being acted upon. Right. Um, so I, I guess that ideally in the future, this data would be, for, um, would be um, at the hands of environmental law enforcement officers who would see that there's a problem in a particular suburb, go there right. and find out what it was and put a stop to it. Yeah, and that certainly is one of the things that policymakers should do and with that data. And in fact, they're willing to do it. It's mm -hmm. just that the system doesn't exist. Right. Because right now, what we have is a market with a bunch of offerings that are certainly not affordable, not even to the global north, okay, let alone the global south. Mm -hmm. And But I know that, and now that we are learning a lot about the ecosystem, that municipalities, um, provinces, uh, Department of Health do have air quality officers mm -hmm. that worry about what's going on. It's just that they find themselves in a quandary. We can't afford to buy these complex, expensive uh, systems from, from abroad. Mm -hmm. Nobody can afford mm -hmm. it. So as such, the Department of Science and Innovation that funds our research uh, has partnered with other stakeholders to say, well, we have the knowledge through the, our research at the European Lab CERN, what particle physicists do to provide cost-effective solutions and give us a chance to roll out um, thousands, tens of thousands of systems, which would be affordable. Would certainly, yep. the cost would be far offset by the benefits. Yeah, I was going to ask how many, ideally how many of these devices you'd need to deploy across a city the size of Johannesburg. Right, I mean, that's a very difficult question because you really have to pinpoint the hotspots. You need to worry about safety, vandalisms. You really mm. have to locate sensors strategically. Do they have to be outside? Um, ideally, yes, because the moment you are inside, there's some filtering that happens. Right. And then you don't get the real picture of what's going on on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, and But I mean, you certainly, I mean, a city of Johannesburg would need probably thousands. Okay. How many that needs to be fine-tuned, mm -hmm. but it certainly it is in the thousands. Okay. It's not in the millions. Sure. Uh, it's really thousands would be a reasonable number to start getting a uh, reasonably accurate grid mm. of information. Okay. And who should pay for it? Should it be uh, the local city council or should it be the Department of the Environment? Where should the funding be coming from? Well, I will leave that to police. To the politicians. <laughs> it's a very <laughs> okay. complicated. That's, that's not within our purview. Uh, our job is to basically provide that indigenous solution yeah. that is affordable to the cities mm -hmm. and government. Okay. Now, we all know that uh, the cost of technology comes down if you start to produce it at scale. Yeah. Um, do you see an opportunity to take this innovation that you've developed here and export it in some way into other markets around the world? We are currently working to uh, take this technology to other countries in Africa through mm -hmm. the networks that the uh, Canadian IDSC has generated and, and funds. So we're now currently talking to Ghana, to Cameroon, to Morocco, and the network is growing very fast because, I mean, what's the point of reinventing the wheel if mm -hmm. you have already a cost-effective solution? Mm -hmm. And since we're not doing this for profit, you know, people can take that technology and other governments can actually also profit from it. And that's certainly part of the conversation okay. that we're having. Okay, okay. Yeah. Is there a way to, to I mean, you say this is not, not done for profit, but is, is there a way potentially to commercialize it? I think there is. I think there are major opportunities, and I, I think the private sector could profit from it greatly as well. And ideally, it would be great if we had um, everyone contributing to it, because businesses also suffer mm. from poor air quality in a very, very significant way. In a direct way, I wouldn't say indirect, in a direct way as well, even the fact that labor productivity uh, there's been measurements about what is the loss of labor productivity due to the increase of the concentration of particulate matter by 10 units or 15 units. Mm -hmm. So imagine if you are close to fires. So you are affected as well. Why are people tired? Why do people have headaches? Mm. So ideally, I would love to see the private sector also get involved in this conversation. Yeah, yeah. Excellent initiative. I, um, I can't wait for them to go on sale because I'm going to get one myself. Uh, the, uh, I've noticed a, a smell of plastic in the air in my neighborhood in the last... Uh, the year or so, and I think it's vagrants burning cables or something in the in the nearby park, and um, it would be very useful to know exactly what I'm breathing. I'm sure there are many other South Africans right. 
who feel exactly the same way. Bruce Malato is Professor of Physics at the University of the Witwatersrand. Thank you so much for coming into the Tech Central studio today and sharing this fascinating story with our audience. Thanks for having me. Pleasure.